Hey, Steve, thank you so much for joining us. You're on Strange Grooves, finally. I'm so excited. Yeah, well, it's thanks so much for having me. A long time coming, I'll tell it you. It has been, it has been. Yeah, I, I've been telling Sharice um, literally now for years um, how excited I've been to kind of share your your love and your experience of music, um, some of the, the places you've been to experience music and, and stuff I've, I've shared with her that, I don't know, blow some of our, 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 our fans' minds. So I'm excited to kind of get into that. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm really excited to be here. You know, music is a really important part of my life and, and I don't often get an opportunity to stretch out and talk about it for, you know, a, a whole a whole chunk of time, an episode like this. So it's 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 great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, no, we're we're excited. So I wanna I wanna talk a little bit about um music and how it affects us in the day to day. One of the reasons that we started this podcast is you know, music for so many people is it's, it's a, it's a connector. Um, Sharice has said it's, it's an equalizer. It can bring anyone and of all places and, and backgrounds together. Um, but also in life, you can be experiencing so many highs and lows sometimes in the same day. And music is that, that thing that can kind of help um, keep that balance. And I think in work and in some of the things that we do, it really, I don't know. I think it's gotten a lot of us through and gets us through life. And I'd kind of like to hear about your, your love of music starting maybe from when you were younger and, and maybe how it's kind of gotten you to your love of music now. And then maybe we'll go a little bit deeper. Yeah. Um, I, I hear, hear what you're saying about like a place of refuge, right? Yeah. Um, uh, at, you know, a, a most, at, at the most difficult times of my life, uh, music has always been there as a place of refuge and a place to go back and get recharged. And, um, you know, I, I think back to when I first started really becoming conscious of music as, as, a, as a growing human being. And, uh, and really, it was in India. I was around uh, 10 years old. I lived in India from 1967 to 1969. And my parents were in this organization called the Peace Corps. And one of the distinctive things about the Peace Corps was that young Americans who volunteered to go work overseas in the Peace Corps got a deferment from going into the draft into Vietnam. So uh, there were all these folks around my house in India, young people who were playing like all of the latest rock and roll music that was coming out of San Francisco which is where I started getting exposed to bands like The Doors um, right as their music was, was coming out. And, uh, and so the, you know, that was really the, 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 first, the first music I started connecting with was on the one hand, stuff that was sort of coming out of that San Francisco scene of the late 60s, San Francisco, LA. And then my mom uh, was really into jazz music. Uh, and she had some old Louis Armstrong uh, uh, records. And I think that that probably the first music that really spoke to my soul where I really started grooving on it in my own right was Louis Armstrong, probably doing St. Louis blues or something like that. Um, that actually spoke to me more than than the rock music did at that time. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah, I always like how um, certain, you know, uh, your your love of music can kind of stem from so many different places, right? And mm -hmm. for, yeah, for me, my grandmother would always pay, play like Patsy Cline records and stuff when I was a kid. She always had a few of those laying around. So now even as I get older, I always, I one of the first things I got was a Patsy Cline record when I started my vinyl collection. So mm -hmm. next thing, when I see you next, I'll make sure I'll bring you a Louis Armstrong record. We'll start, we'll start yeah. pushing back. <laughs> I can be imagined. I always wonder what ima like imagine what it would be like to like be around like listening to the doors for the first time that everyone else was listening to the doors, like the reaction to it, because it was like that kind of music was so different, like coming out of that San Francisco scene. It was very it was quite different from what's been was popular, I guess, up until that point. Yeah, well, it was, um, uh, you know, you knew that something new was going on. It was very, very different. It was very rebellious. It was very new. And, uh, and, and um, it went along with other stuff, right? So I knew that, that people were growing their hair long. I didn't know that people were smoking weed yet, but I, you know, I, knew, I knew about psychedelic artwork and, and I'd been seeing the posters. And so 
I was even from like on the other side of the world, I was getting the vibration that there was this new scene. There was something like very new and very fresh that was that was very that was going on. It wasn't really until I got back to to the States in 1969 that I started being able to to really immerse myself uh, in that. But but it was, you know, I was catching it that that in, in those early times. So when you said you moved back to the States in, in 1969, where where in the States did you where did you move to? Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. So lots of stuff happening <laughs> in that area at the time. Steve was busy. Yeah, he was on a, a little bit of a mission, a little bit. He, I don't think he stopped really uh, since then, but. Right. No, I, I mean, I um, <clears throat> when I when I came back to Washington, D.C., which is where we had lived before we went to India, mm-hmm. I was I was fresh from, you know, playing with uh, with brown kids in villages that had, you know, mud huts and thatched roofs. And I came back and the war in Vietnam was in full force at that time. And I turn on the TV and see these great big B-52 planes dropping bombs on villages that looked just like the place that I'd been. And I just knew that it was wrong. I didn't, I didn't have to engage in a debate. All I had to do was look at it to see that it was wrong. And so I was really, um, you know, very much into the anti-war movement and hippie culture from the from the moment that I got back um, uh, here. In fact, I um, uh, it was uh, I, I first got my first exposure to real hippie underground culture in London in 1969. On my way back from, from India, we stopped in London, and uh, and I'll never forget walking down Carnaby Street. And uh, which was like the big fashion street um, where all the hippie fashion was, and um, uh, and reading my first underground newspaper, uh, which was called If, uh, and uh, in Hyde 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 Park Square in London. So yeah, um, it was it was you knew you knew you knew, you you know all I had to do was just take a look at it and get the very little bit of a listen to it and i knew that like this was my tribe and these and these were my people and uh and sure enough is you know once i got back to the states then it was really you know a a deeper dive into into the politics into the music into the culture Mm -hmm. wow it's so neat yeah i just find that that era to be fascinating also terrifying but fascinating and what what can you tell us a little bit um and some of our audience who may not know your background maybe as well as as we do but about how maybe music played a a part in those in those years and and the war and and you know bringing people like yourself activists together well um you know rock music then was it, it was you know the music itself was viewed by most of society as as being subversive and 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 it really was because it, it carried all kinds of, of messages to us and you know some of them were obvious and some of them were more hidden but you know when when we were marching against the the war in vietnam uh you know one of the bands that i listened to all the time was country joe and the fish and he had this you know this great song one two three four what are we fighting for don't ask me i don't give a damn next stop is vietnam and very satirical, um, and I probably shouldn't try to sing on this show or any other show, <clears throat> but um, it was validating, right? Because I was like a 13, 14 year old kid who believed in these things. All the adults around me, all my teachers, my parents, the police, everybody else was against the things that I, was, I believed in. But here were these rock albums that were played on the radio that were, that were telling me that I was right, that were telling me that I was part of a larger movement, that was telling me that I wasn't the only one that was there, that was telling me that I was connected to this larger community. And, and it was validating and empowering in this really, really intense way um, uh, to, it was like, it was one of the few signs that you could, that you get anywhere that, that you that you weren't the only one that you believed in and other people believed in this thing and this change was coming so it was um it's hard to overstate the role that music played in 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 our thinking then it was before the internet um uh you know almost all of our sources of information were monopolized by by the other side 
And it was really music was one of the few channels that we had that we could communicate with each other and talk to each other and inspire each other. Wow, that's very powerful. That yeah. what you like the last part you just said, where it's not monopolized, you know, and, and it's not, you know, deeply influenced or controlled and in, in, you know, some of the ways we see today. Um, that was really the way to communicate. And it and it still is. People can still make music and and really connect with each other, even through just tones and you know, the way lyrics are written. And I think, yeah, I mean, it plays just as much a part today in some of the things that we're seeing as it as it did in 69 and throughout those years. But yeah, I find it fascinating because um, music is just such a critical um, thing in, in everyone's life. It plays such a different facet, right? Because I, I can hear certain music and it'll bring me to tears right away. It'll bring me to a moment in my life. Um, some moments where I feel extreme happiness and it transports me to a moment. Mm -hmm. And I think like it's, uh, you know, that's why people have wedding songs or first dances. And, you know, it's such a, an interesting um you know, part and to hear you guys sing that song together. It was just like, you know, I, I love how it can bring people, you know, together, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, different generations of, right. of knowledge, right? Like you, you weren't there, but you understand like the music, the people who were creating it at the time. Yeah. And I just find that fascinating. Yeah. And it's so interesting too, particularly around like specifically, you meant like the Viet, the, the anti-war movement of the time. There's so, there's pieces of music from that era that are so synonymous with the Vietnam War and the protests. Like you hear them in every single movie, right? Right? like Buffalo Springfield for what it's worth, uh, all along the Watchtower, <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, uh, yeah. Fortunate Son, CCR, like it's like, you know, it's it's almost like cliche at this point, but they're so yeah. perfect. And there was also, I remember re like watching documentaries about like how, like they call, I someone coined it like Vietnam as like the rock and roll war, because like when, you know, the guys were out like fighting or in the tanks or hanging out, they were listening to this music, mm. you know, like unlike, you know, pre, you know, back in the day, like back in, you know, World War II, it'd be a different kind of right. style, but yeah. like they're listening, like they're in Vietnam and they're listening to like these anti-war songs, right? Like what people were writing back home. So it's such a unique link, I think, to that, like between music and major yeah, event, right? Yeah, big time. Yeah, well, music speaks to our hearts, right? And um, lots of times when we're looking at what's going on in society, we're analyzing it with our minds. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to plan how to make it better. And, and, then, and then music kind of speaks more to the why, right? And why is it important to us? And, and um, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different kind of language, but it's just as important. And you know, um, particularly with cannabis, um, you know, cannabis has always been associated with music. And, uh, and if you, you know, look through the history of, of cannabis around the world, you'll find that almost always wherever there's a cannabis scene, there's some genre of music that's associated with it. And like some of them are really almost lost. You know, we know about jazz and the association of cannabis and jazz. And we know about reggae and the association of cannabis with reggae. We know about hip hop, the association of cannabis with hip hop. But then there's these other types of music, like in Greece in the 1920s, there was this whole scene because uh, they were making hash in Greece and they were shipping it to Egypt. And there's this huge like semi underground hash making scene. And, and it uh, was centered around all the ports of, of Greece. And in all of these ports, they would have cafes where they played this music called rembetica. And, and rembetica or rebetica. And, and if you listen to the rembetica or rebetica music, it's got this same kind of lilting kind of backbeat. It's, it's, there's something that's similar to it around. It's reggae-ish and it's kind of jazz-ish and you can feel the cannabis groove in there. Almost nobody knows about this music. It's like this totally lost cannabis scene because they made cannabis illegal in the 1930s and closed it all down. But I just think about like, you know, today there's all these wild things that are happening with cannabis music. Like I've been doing my podcast, Radio Free Cannabis, and been in touch with people all around the world. And I learned uh, about communities of Rastafarians in Cambodia who are like playing this Cambodian rasta reggae fusion music um uh and you know so it's it's like i think about all of the different 
kinds of styles that there are that have been around the world all the lost styles of cannabis music we're never going to get the opportunity to listen to uh, that have come and gone and all the ones that are happening now it's it's um it's 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 it's, it's this is such a rich time i don't know if young people really recognize um like for me to discover a new kind of music it, it, somebody would have to like, I'd have to read an article about it in a magazine. And then I have to go like find some kind of specialty record store. And then I have to like, you know, order a record specially and like, you know, wait six weeks to go get it. And, and then I would finally be able to get to listen to this music and decide whether it was what I really thought it was going to be. And now it's like, you know, you jump onto Spotify and you throw in a few search words and you could get introduced to some music that you just like never even imagined existed before. It's mm -hmm. such a cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. It, um, it really does open the doors for, you know, a lot of different uh, genres for sure. And a lot of different artists and, you know, their free trial, I mean, makes it even uh, a little easier. I mean, the having a premium right. account is good, but there are some features um i wrote down that style of music because now i'm intrigued i'll have to like youtube it or something and try to see if i can find it because i find that you know fascinating and, and you know a little bit you know frustrating too losing history and, and music especially right there we should be trying to to bring it back a little bit somehow maybe in right. our music <laughs> well you know so much of our history cannabis history has been lost um and it's it now we're beginning to recover it, right? For, for a long time, every historian and geographer and archeologist, either they didn't know to be looking for cannabis or if they recognized it, they like would hide it because they didn't want to jeopardize their career by letting other people know that they knew what cannabis was, right? Uh, and now like all this history is coming out. Um, one of the amazing things I've learned in the course of the, of the quarantine time when I've been mostly locked up here doing a lot of study um, was the ancient Greeks used cannabis extensively through their whole culture. So when you think about the, the Greek philosophers of the academy, the Greek oracles, um, uh, uh, the, um, the, the very first temples that were dedicated to public health in Greece used cannabis as a medicine. And so all of this history is just now becoming to light because there's a, a new generation of, of historians who's willing to look for it and bring it to light. And um, I'm sure there's you know plenty of musicologists out there who are hopefully going to be working on uncovering all of the, the, the hidden history of cannabis and music too. Yeah, I, that's another thing that I wanted to discuss. I mean, I've talked to Sharice quite a bit about it, but I'd, I'd like to our audience to hear a little bit about um, some of your, your work um, in, you know, cannabis reform, but also with some of the music collaboration and partners that are part of, you know, maybe Last Prisoner Project. I think it plays a, you know, one of, one of the things when I first met you that Aside from my own perceptions and experiences with it, both positive and negative, um, one of the things I realized is, you know, race, background, status, everything plays a part, especially when it comes to cannabis, right? And where you grow up, the music that you're exposed to, how you're treated in the justice system all plays a part. And I, I learned that when you were talking to me about Judy Garland, that was one of the first things that I realized was like, wow, that's someone that, you know, everyone, everyone knows Dorothy from the Wizard of Oz, but we don't know anything about you know, maybe some of that, that scene. So I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on, on your work in that, in that sec sector, I'd say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm really fascinated with this guy, Harry Anslinger, who was the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics and was the guy who was responsible for making cannabis illegal at the federal level in the United States. And then after he got done torturing us in the United States, he became commissioner to the United Nations in the early 1960s. And he's the guy that most of the world has to thank for cannabis prohibition being landed upon them. Um, and he, um, uh, he liked celebrities a lot. Um, he liked power a lot. Um, and he liked to manipulate power. So he cultivated different relationships and, and he targeted different people. So um, one of the people, and there's a film coming out about this in, in, in the near future, um, that he targeted was Billie Holiday. Uh, Harry Anslinger hated Billie Holiday 
because of a strange fruit, which was a song that was written about lynching that Billie Holiday popularized and um, and uh, and sang. And um, in order to stop her from singing uh, the song, they took away her, in those days you had to have a cabaret license, a license in order to perform. And because she would not stop singing the song, uh, Anslinger arranged to have her cabaret license taken away from her um, and, uh, and made it so that she couldn't work. And then after she kept on performing, even without the cabaret license, um, he had her staked out, he had her surveilled, um, he had her uh, uh, busted repeatedly. Um, and, um, and, you know, like a lot of the jazz musicians of that time, she was a user of heroin and, and, uh, and cannabis. And uh, basically, Anslinger targeted her relentlessly and made it impossible for her to work and, and then eventually arrested her. And, uh, and she ended up dying in a, in a prison hospital in custody. Um, so that was how he treated Billie Holiday. Um, at the same time that, that all of this was going on, he had developed a relationship with Judy Garland. Judy, of course, is the actress that played Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. She was also a singer. She was an actress. She appeared on Broadway. Uh, and her image was the all-American girl. She, she was Dorothy. Um, and uh, unbeknownst to most of the public, she was also a morphine addict. Now, uh, because she was a actress and she had the right kind of relationships, she had a doctor that wrote her prescriptions for her morphine. Um, and so uh, she was fairly well set, except that Anslinger um, heard uh, uh, and found out about what was going on and started leaning on her to, to stop doing the morphine. Um, he thought there would be a public relations disaster, right? You can't have um, um, uh, Dorothy ODing on morphine. Uh, that would be embarrassing for the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. So, um, uh, so he would um, uh, get in touch with her agents and her managers and basically um, tell them that they knew what was going on and urge her to go into rehab, um, uh, but never really do anything to her about it. And this went on for a number of uh, for a number of years, of course, until until she died. So on the one hand, you have you know a black outspoken activist artist, Billie Holiday, who is persecuted uh, and hounded to her death by Anslinger um, uh, because of her position on racism, uh, versus Judy Garland, who is coddled and enabled and protected um, until eventually she you know she dies basically by, by her own bad habits. Right. Which were drugs that were not cannabis. No. <laughs> right? Drugs that were not cannabis. Exactly. No. Um, and you know, this is, um, this is, this is a pattern. Another one of the biggest villains in, in American history is a guy named uh, Joseph McCarthy, Senator Joseph McCarthy, mm -hmm. who was responsible for the red scares and, um, and uh, purging a lot of people uh, in Hollywood. He also was a morphine addict. Anslinger also knew about his morphine use and Anslinger also enabled his morphine use in return for political favors. So, um, you know, there's a, a long history of, of, uh, of, of, of drug policy and politics and, uh, and music being, being intertwined. And, you know, I think that it happens everywhere. Why? Because um, musicians have power. Uh, entertainers have power, poets have power, writers have power. And, it, you know, this is, 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 you know, you've always seen conflict between different types of elite and artists because good artists speak the truth and, 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 and most elites don't want the truth to be spoken. True that. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah, it's powerful. Can you tell us a little bit more um, in the audience, a little bit about your, um, you know, your, your founding of Last Prisoner Project and, and again, how music and cannabis and people's, you know, passion and, and you know, love of community, um, you know, was really kind of helping that project take off. Um, I'm loving seeing, you know, some of the results that, I mean, definitely not enough, never enough, but I'd love to, to educate our audience a little bit more on, on how they can also get involved in with uh, Last Prisoner Project. 
Yeah, the Last Prisoner Project's been one of the real uh, bright spots in my life over the course of the, of the past couple of years. I got the vision for Last Prisoner Project in 2017. I was in Toronto, in Canada, in the financial district uh, at the top of a very impressive skyscraper at the, at the end of a long conference table. Um, and I was talking to people about legal cannabis. I was trying to raise money um, for the, the market that was getting ready to open up in California in 2018. And uh, the feeling in that room was really good. People were you know, thinking about uh, what was gonna happen. There were a lot of zeros, there were a lot of spreadsheets. Nobody in the room was afraid of getting busted. That wasn't even a, a thought. And my phone started buzzing towards the end of the day. And you know, normally I'd, I wouldn't interrupt a meeting like that, but in this case, it was my buddy Chuck who was calling me from a prison in Pennsylvania uh, where he was serving four years for transporting 14 pounds of cannabis from California to Pennsylvania. And so I ducked out into the hallway. I, I took the call with Chuck and it was, it was grim, right? Because it's just grim to talk to your friends when they're locked up in prison. And so when I walked back in the conference room, I was still feeling that, that grimness. I was still feeling that sadness. And I looked around the room and I saw everybody being really happy. And I took a look at all those spreadsheets on the table and all those zeros. And I knew that for me, I could not continue to work on projects like that and make bank on legal cannabis and not do something to help my friend Chuck and everybody else like him. I would not be able to look at myself in the mirror in the morning. And, and I realized that immediately that I had to do something. The second thing I realized as I looked at all of those spreadsheets and all of those zeros, and I thought about all of the other meetings that were happening in Toronto at that moment with other people and other companies like mine, I realized there was something we could do. It wasn't just some noble cause, you know, get all the cannabis prisoners out. If we just peel off one or two or 3% of all of those dollars that are sitting on all of those tables, we can get the job done. And, uh, and so um, that, that was the vision for Last Prisoner Project. You know, go to the legal cannabis industry and uh, try to persuade them to fund an organization that will make sure that people who are still doing time for doing exactly the same thing that the legal industry is doing mm -hmm. are released. And it worked. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, sometimes you get these crazy ideas and they go nowhere. And sometimes you get them and, and, and an army of angels rises up and helps you wrestle them to the ground. And, and that's what's happened with the Last Prisoner Project. And there's just been a really um, great response first from, a, you know, our staff who started out as volunteers and worked for months without uh, any kind of compensation until we got our, our fundraising up and going. Um, uh, to um, to uh, people like uh, like Jim Belushi and Damian Marley and Stephen Marley and uh, Melissa Etheridge, um, uh, uh, Revolution, uh, Eric Rachmani, uh, a, a, a lot of artists who you know we we weren't initially targeting but were moved by the cause, and they've lent support uh, to us, and that's helped us build a really large base of support in the industry. Um, we've been able to hire six full-time staff members and in the course of you know, the last 18 months have been pretty successful at, at getting people out of prison. We've uh, been working with a lot of other organizations who have been you know, working on this for, for longer than we have. Um, we've managed to see a lot of you know, really hundreds of prisoners released on compassionate release because of COVID. And then most recently, we saw some of our longest serving prisoners released. Um, Corvain Cooper, who was serving a life without parole, sentenced for distribution of cannabis, uh, was released uh, just a few months ago. Uh, Richard DeLisi, who was the longest serving nonviolent prisoner in the United States, he was serving a 90 year pr uh, prison sentence for cannabis, uh, released. And, uh, and Michael Thompson, who was serving a 40 to 60 year sentence for selling three pounds of cannabis to a narc um, was released after serving 25 years of, of that sentence. Um, a nice footnote to Michael's uh, um, uh, case, um, you know, we always try to make sure that our constituents have a, a good place to land after they get out of prison because, you know, you leave prison and you have nothing, you don't have a place to live, you have no money, you have nothing. And, um, uh, but in this case, um, we were helped by our good friend, Sean King, 
And uh, Sean uh, on his network put out a call for donations to buy Michael a house and in 24 hours raised more than $260,000. And so now Michael Thompson went from uh, being in a prison cell to living in his own home. And he just had his 70th birthday this past week, didn't he? He did. He just had his 70th birthday. I saw it on Instagram. It was wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful so great. to see, you know. I remember last year writing letters and then just being able to see see him out. So it's nice kind of seeing the community, you know, come together and embrace that project. And, you know, even, even seeing folks in New Brunswick now start to kind of see what it is. And, you know, I know that it's, uh, it affects a lot of people, you know, in the States, but even here, cannabis laws, the way that it's been affected, even with our industry going legal in the past couple of years, um, people still with um, records, people that I know very personal to me, um, if they were to get caught with anything more than an ounce in their car, even though it's legal to buy more than an ounce at Cannabis NB, they would get 14 years at the penitentiary for trafficking. Um, and, you know, these are people who are in their 50s and 60s who, you know, who haven't known anything more, who haven't, you know, worked and, and you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's scary. So, you know, I see like on 420 people, um, it's hard to enjoy because you also realize that there are people still sitting in darkness that are sitting there for something that you're taking a break to enjoy. Mm. So it's, uh, it's good to be conscious, a conscious consumer. And that's what I find last prisoner project, aside from the, the, the real work that you guys are doing behind the scenes, the everyday work. I think that's what it, it does for the everyday person who maybe can't be as effective to your, to your mission. It makes us more conscious and, and, uh, more, um, uh, in, intention, intentional with, with our purchasing power, I think with buying merch and things like that. Yeah. Look, there's a, there's a battle going on for the soul of the cannabis industry and every cannabis consumer is a soldier in that battle, whether consciously or unconsciously, our dollars are either going to go to companies that support our community are going to go to companies that don't care about our community or are going to go to companies that might actively do things against our community. And it's up to every cannabis consumer to educate themselves um, and make the appropriate choices. So what we've done to try and help that move that process forward with Last Prisoner Project, we have two programs. One is our Partners for Freedom uh, program. We, are, we work with cannabis manufacturers and in return for ongoing support at Last Prisoner Project, we give them the right to put the Last Prisoner Project broken chain logo on their packages. So if you're uh, shopping, uh, I don't know, we, we don't have any in Canada yet. Uh, if, if there's any manufacturers out there who would like to participate in the program, let us know. Um, but for those of your audience who's uh, in the United States and you're in a legal state, uh, when you're making your purchasing decisions, look for the LPP logo to identify the, the companies, the manufacturers are supporting us. And then we also have a program at the dispensary level called Roll It Up for Freedom. Uh, which uh, consumers can actually participate in. We just uh, ask uh, cannabis consumers to donate the change from their purchase to LPP. And then uh, we aggregate all of that, all of that small change and make a very big impact with it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's so cool. Yeah, it goes, it goes a long way. And, and, you know, hopefully it'll be in Canada. I think, I think like um, if you're going to be a company in business where everything can be so saturated now, I mean, we, we see in Canada, a lot of B Corps, same within America as well. A lot of B Corps, but I think if you're going to be in, in good business, um, thinking about the triple bottom line mm -hmm. and in a different way and how you contribute as a business um, is really important, especially especially after a pandemic. And now what we've seen, is, I mean, I, I'm certain that you've seen it even before things were becoming legal, is the oversaturation of cannabis companies competing for, yeah. you know, especially with not being able to maybe brand their packages certain ways or, you know, market themselves. But here in Canada, we've seen a, a real decline um, in the, I'd say, the quality of cannabis, um, the distribution of it, um, how it's maybe presented, uh, even online from a, a, an online shopping experience. Um, so I think it definitely all plays a, a, a part in it. Mm. But yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, look, what, what, what we have learned out of the experience in California and the experience in Canada is that how cannabis is legalized is just as important as when it is legalized. Yeah. And, you know, there's been a real temptation, and I've fallen prey to that temptation myself, to achieve legalization 
at any cost, right? Because people are getting arrested, they're going to prison, terrible things are happening to people and you wanna stop that and you wanna stop it as soon as you possibly can. But what we've also learned is, is, that, is that decisions can be made that, 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 that are really, really important that are not easily unmade later on. And so, you know, both in Canada and in California, we've seen this situation where the people who know this plant best, who know how to grow the best cannabis, who know how to manufacture the best products, who understand the history and the nature of the plant best, who love it the most, have been squeezed out of the industry. And in their place, people who are good at raising money, people who are good at influencing politicians, people who are good at filling out applications uh, are, are taking leading roles in the, in the industry. And the results are really clear, right? You just have to take a look at the Canadian uh, stock exchange and you can see how well all of those people who were very good at, at compliance and finance did with actually growing and selling cannabis. Yeah. They haven't done well at all, right? And, uh, <laughs> and so eventually, sooner or later, the industry is going to have to turn to the subject matter experts. And the subject matter experts, like it or not, are people who love cannabis. So um, we're going through, you know, some some twists and turns here with the with the birth of the of the legal industry. Uh, you know, my message to to everybody who cares about this plan is get in the ring and wrestle, right? Get in the ring and wrestle. Um, this is this is our time, and the decisions that are being made now about how this industry is going to be structured are are ones we're going to have to live with for for a long time potentially. So. Uh, it's, 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 it's worth understanding and getting there and fighting for it. Yeah. And I think, you know, being a part of, um, last prisoner project, if you're a cannabis company is, you know, the first, the first step into definitely having that bigger impact, right. Or even trying to find a way to, you know, sell the merch or have flyers or just ways that people can, you know, be associated with the cause. I just think that's a, a, just a primary. So for any cannabis companies listening, uh, make sure you pull your socks up and get affiliated with Last Prisoner Project because you look it. like look like a bozo if you don't. Especially you Canadian yeah. producers. Uh, and, and we have a lot of really good ones. A lot of craft uh, cannabis producers that are making really good, good products using really innovative methods, I, I'd say. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I find it to be um, very, very intriguing um, the different way that the markets and the stock is going and, you know, Canada, we, we pride ourselves on, on good cannabis, but some of the LPs are definitely not producing as such. So it's, it's interesting, um, as consumers, right. You have to be also conscious about what you're getting from those producers who may not be as thoughtful about what they're creating for you. Right. And, and now it's almost a little bit better to be able to grow your own, but you, you also need to be able to do your research and, and, know how to grow it right. so it's, it's it's interesting kind of seeing seeing what's been happening over the past year i'd say yeah sharice doesn't have any plants yet but maybe I someday have. we'll i'm figure. like i can barely keep my spider plant alive so like i grew <laughs> two i might need some kate help if i, I grew two a cannabis plant uh, well me and pete grew two in the house this year and they turned out great we got a few ounces off them they're great we made some oil it's we've been giving away some oil it's been right. it's been the gift that keeps on giving right so it's been good right. No. And cannabis is different, Sharice. You might you might kill every other plant, but cannabis just it's might bad. be different. It, it, might be, yeah. it really does. You just have to just pay attention, right? Yes. No bugs and you're and you're good. Right. Oh, I had to try it. As I said, yeah, I'm well, help Kate. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Um, one yeah. of the things I also wanted to ask you, um, because I know music plays such a, a big part in our lives, is, is some of maybe your your most memorable music experiences. Um, I know that you love going to concerts and, and seeing things and you probably have a wealth of, of experience, but could you share a few with us? Yeah, well, um, I think that my, probably my most memorable musical experiences have been the ones that weren't performances. Um, uh, so, <clears throat> You know, in 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 uh, in the 1980s, and in, in back in my hometown of Washington D.C., um, uh, I, um, I I had a, a club for a little while that got closed down um, before we really got started, and and uh, and as a result, I opened up a basically a 
a commune that had an underground nightclub attached to it. And every Saturday night for more than three years, we had these huge potluck gatherings. And um, this yeah. is a, a time in Washington, D.C., where <clears throat> the uh, Reagan Republicans had come in and there had been a shift from progressive Democrats. And these people were coming in with their diamonds and their limousines and their fancy balls. And and they like closed down all of all of the venues that we had where we could do our thing in D.C. It was like in this period of cultural reaction and retrenchment. So I got this nine bedroom house out on the outskirts of Washington, DC, an old Victorian with a great big wraparound veranda and a huge basement. And, uh, and it became kind of our refuge to get through the 1980s. And a bunch of cannabis activists came and rented rooms in, in the spot. And every Saturday, we would have these gatherings where we just encouraged anybody who loved cannabis and loved music to come. And we'd ask people to bring, you know, anything like just give us, you know, bring something. You can bring a, a, a jug of juice or you can bring a, a, a casserole or you can bring some potato soup, bring something to share. And so, you know, we would have sometimes hundreds of people that would show up and um, and we became this uh, venue um, for musicians. A lot of the musicians in D.C. at that time were also feeling kind of homeless, right? And, and, and they would go do their paid gigs. Um, uh, but then after the paid gigs, after the bars closed, they would all show up at, at what came to be known as the Nut House. Um, exactly. Well, it was on Butternut Street. And, and we were, when we were moving into the house, there was a planter's nut shop right down the street that was, that was closing. And they had taken their sign and they put their sign in the dumpster. And the sign said, assorted nuts. So as soon as we saw that, we took it and we put it up on top of our, of our doorway and the place became the nut house. Um, but back to the music part of the nut house, the really cool part was, you know, I was, I was dealing a lot of weed underground then. And most of my, most of people that were getting weed for me were musicians. So the nut house would really jump off. Um, bars then closed at one o'clock in DC. So around 1 2 o'clock, things would really start happening at the nut house when like the best players in DC would get off of their paid gigs and then they would come out to our place and show up. And we just have these unbelievable full blown psychedelic meltdown jam sessions with like some of the best players in the city, 200 mics of LSD and maybe they'd never even met each other before. Right. And uh, there were times uh, during those years when I just, I would sit back and I would be just enveloped by the sound and all of these people around. And I was just like, you know what? <laughs> if I get to heaven and it's not as good as this, this, it just kick me out and send me right back here. Right. I'll, I'll, I'm happy to stay here for an eternity. So it, it was the times I think when so much of music these days is a performance. So much of it's attached to dollars. It's attached to selling tickets and records that the pure giving of music um, uh, for the joy of sharing it, for the joy of creating it. Those are the, are the moments that have always been, I, I think, that have come to be the most memorable moments for me. So, you know, I mean, um, watching The Who uh, uh, from the fourth row center stage um, at, um, at the stadium in Washington, DC, um, uh, was uh you know it's an amazing experience you know being able to see the you know the sweat on walter roger daltrey's forehead but um um but the but but it has been most meaningful for me in non-commercial settings at rainbow gatherings uh, around the campfire um uh at, on marches when we've you know been getting ready uh to go into into battle um uh, i remember one time uh um uh, one of the most memorable musical experiences of my life was the night before the 4th of July smoke in in Washington, DC. This is in 1978. And we didn't know whether the cops were going to let us put the smoke in on or not. And, and we're all gathered in this, in this, another commune <laughs> in downtown DC. And there's, there are cop cars like at each end of the block and they're watching people who are coming in and out of the house, they're surveilling us. We don't know whether they're gonna like raid us in the middle of the night or not. And, um, and uh, crazy Dave Stonefeather, crazy Dave, wherever you are, brother, I love you. You're out there somewhere, I know. 
crazy Dave Stonefeather started doing this rousing rendition of Vernon and Luton. And, and he, started, he started playing it in, 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 in the front room, right? But the house was packed because we had like all these hippies from all over the country who were crashing on the floor, right? So he started strumming it out and he started singing it out. And then everybody in the front room started singing along with him. And then, and then the room next door picked it up. And then we could hear people upstairs singing and, and the whole house was singing Burnin' and Lutin. Um, on this night before the smoke-in. And, and I can still, as I tell you this story, feel the energy that was crackling in the air then. Wow. Yeah, that's what I find so impactful about music. And I, and I know what you mean, like, you know, the, the Who is a, you know, tremendous experience. It's cool to see, you know, bands and whatnot, but mm -hmm. it's, it, those are those moments that, you know, still shape you when you talk about them to people that, you know, who, weren't there that you can probably still smell the air remember the people that were around you and you know sometimes I can't remember yesterday but I can remember how I felt going to my first all ages punk rock show and crowd surfing mm -hmm. and how you know putting that trust into people I didn't know and and feeling like I fit in like you know the the land of misfit toys and I think that's yeah. uh that's so important to have in life I think that's what kind of keeps you going maybe as a, as a human being. Yeah. You bring up a really good point too, about like you say, like my, some of my best music memories were, are, weren't at concerts. They were like outside and it really often when we, a lot on the show, when we talk about, you know, music memories, a lot of it is formed around concerts, but I, when I think about it too, back in my life, I have really great memories with music, whether it was like being, you know, it was, having one too many beer and like belting tiny dancer with a group of friends right in their apartment yeah. or like you yeah. know late night drives with friends to the beach like yeah. or you know parties or like um other milestones um and it could be really mundane like nothing super you know yeah they, nothing they, they stand out they stand out because it you know you from what you were feeling or who you were with or what was going on at the time right and those are really significant sometimes some of the most significant music memories as well right yeah, I think so too. Well, you know, it's really interesting. You think about um, for most of human history before we had recording technology, it, it wasn't, it, you know, people sang for each other and, and to each other. It wasn't that, you know, that there was a certain designated class of people who were musicians, who were singers, who were songwriters. It was something that we all did together all the time. Um, and, you know, one of the cool things that I've done during the COVID time was I've started, can't tell from my voice right now, but I have started taking singing lessons and learning how to sing. Nice. Love and it. so I've been thinking about singing a lot and how <clears throat> before we really had this, you know, concept of performances and, 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 and professional um, uh, entertainers, that it was something that we all did for each other. You know, you would sing on your way to work. You would sing to your kids at night. You would get together as a family celebrating a holiday and you would sing songs. Um, and I think that um, I'd like to see that come back, right? I think that one of the things that we've lost with, with recording and with professional uh, music is, is just music being a part of our everyday lives. That's something that all of us can do. It's something that we can each give to each other. Um, so if I have a wish for the future for music, it, it would be that it, you know, that it, that it become more a part of our everyday lives and that it not be, you know, like, I think this flows out of my own experience. Um, <clears throat> at some point, fairly early, somebody convinced me that I didn't know how to sing and that I would never be able to learn how to sing. And, and, and a lot of that came, I was easily convinced because I would look at all these professional singers and they were just singing this amazing stuff. I go, I could never do that, right? And I think I really lost a lot because of that because actually it turns out I can sing. I mean, I'm never gonna be Pavarotti, right? But if you put me in a group of five or six other people, I can carry a tune. Yeah. And I can have that experience of being in the music with people. And so I think that, that that's a lot more accessible. I think that there's probably like millions and millions of people like me who think that they can't sing because they're comparing themselves to professional performers. But actually, really, you can, you know, just have to twist the lens a little bit. Yeah, or the microphone. Bolt. Or the microphone. <laughs> right? It's auto -tune, right? Auto -tune, people are say. making millions off of it. So, hey, right. I, I won't throw it out in the, in the garbage yet. We'll see. Right. We'll see. No, I don't know. Um, so another thing I, I kind of wanted to ask you um, is 
I know like music's a, a big part of your life and I know that you, you know, you've got lots of playlists and things like that. Um, what are you listening to right now? Wow. Um, well, it's kind of all over the place. Um, I think lately uh, um, I've been listening to a lot of um, I've been, well, I've been listening to a lot of Spanish language music. Um, and um, so lately I've been talking a lot about the, the cannabis tribe, right. And, and the international cannabis tribe. And, and, and this rap comes out of my travels in 2019 where I got to go to four different continents, a whole bunch of different countries visiting emerging cannabis economies. And, and I came out of that set of experiences with the understanding that <clears throat> there are hundreds of millions of us around the world who have had basically the same set of experiences with cannabis, wherever we are, right? Um, whatever our race is, whatever our religion is, whatever our nationality is, whatever our language is, our economic position, our educational level, our gender, wherever else we identify, right? It, it cuts across all of those categories. And collectively, we're larger than all but the largest nations in, in the world, right? So I've been thinking a lot about um, about how do we get in touch with each other, right? How do we talk to each other? Because we speak all of these various different languages, right? But if we could talk to each other and we could like figure out how to do things all at one time, just imagine the ways we could start impacting the world. So I've been listening to a lot of music um, uh, from bands that sort of speak to that tip, to that vibration. So um, Alerta Camarada, um, uh, uh, out of Colombia is, is a band that I've been listening to a lot who sort of articulates um, uh, that, that global kind of cannabis vibration. Um, I've been uh, listening to, um, now I need my playlist in front of me. Uh, I listen to so much different stuff. I've been listening to um, uh, Soul Majestic, uh, which provided the, uh, the title cut um, for Radio Free Cannabis, you can you can listen to them. Um, I've been uh, listening a lot of the uh, cumbia music that's coming out of out of Colombia right now is really um, uh, has a you know pretty powerful vibration of change that's attached to it. Um, but I go all over the place too, right? So it, it, a lot of this depends on 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 where I'm at. Um, one of the songs that for some reason I I got hung up on. Um, and just kept on listening to over and over again in the morning. It was like my get up in the morning and get me going over the, uh, the last uh, few months has been um, um, safety dance. Yes. Really? Yeah. And it's like, I don't know where safety dance came from, but one morning it just like, I was like, oh, I, I got to hear safety dance. And then it just kind of got under my skin. Right. And, and, I've, been, and I've been going with it. Um, then there's like, there's, um, I have, you know, there's times when, um, you know, there's times when I get kind of a little bit bitter about, uh, about, uh, about some of the slings and arrows uh, that I've suffered along the way on this journey over the last 40 or 50 years. So I'll listen to songs like, um, <clears throat> like Tweeter and the Monkey Man uh, or Copperhead Road um, uh, or, um, uh, some of the other songs in that groove um so you know kind of kind of i get in, into my into my darker darker grooves right yeah. um and then uh, when i'm in need of inspiration um lately um i've been listening to back to back i've been listening to um uh link ray and the neville brothers fire and brimstone now I'm not a Christian, right? So fire and brimstone doesn't, you know, doesn't really speak to me, but but I am a spiritual person, and the passion of 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 that's that those two uh, artists bring to that song really uh, lights me up. Um, uh, so I'm 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 really kind of all over the place uh, with my music. I think depending depending on mood. Oh, same. And yeah. it can, it can change within minutes. That's the, that's one good thing about, you know, um, having devices is, you know, it, it is good, but that's another reason why we collect records is because sometimes having that, um, shuffle is, I don't think it's, it's good for you. I think you should be able to sit down and 
train your mind to sit and listen to a whole album. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's hard. It's even sometimes to listen to the whole album, you know, full side to side. Sometimes you just listen to a side and I'll make myself keep the record on to the next time. So I flip it and I I won't change the record. Um, because I think it's important. And I think a lot of people put a lot of effort into, um, their music and their records and the sleeves some do some don't right um and and that's part of the reason why we collect records and you know we're so glad that we met and found out we collected records right so now i mean luckily we don't have to all buy the same duplicate so we save a bit of money now because records are a bit expensive yeah it's a pricey hobby (laughs) (laughs) no i I get it right i mean we always would listen to an album all the way through Right? Yeah. And you were you were you were listening to the songs, but you were also listening to the album and you were yeah. absorbing the cover art. Yeah. And it was all it was all part of a package. And I think that um, you really put your, your finger on something interesting. It's it, it almost becomes physically painful to not switch to something. We're so used to being able to just, you know, if, if, if there's something that rubs us at all the wrong way about something, we just move on. And, and what happens is you, you don't really give artists a chance to make a full and complete statement. And you may rob yourself of what ultimately would end up being a very meaningful experience with that art piece of art by just moving on too quickly, not giving it enough of a chance. So I think that's a really, that's a really good, good point that you make. Oh, yeah. And I think, you know, we've found, especially in the last couple of years, um, a lot more record stores, music stores in general are opening up and artists, um, musicians are now creating not just vinyl again, but CDs, cassettes, um, and not just, you know, digital download codes. Like it's, it's really a variety of um, formats. And it's the same with podcasts, right? It's, they're really trying to be inclusive to the listener and be where the ears and eyes are. And I mean, that's, I think even artwork on some records is the reason why I buy it. So I have to be careful sometimes, right? Sometimes it doesn't turn out to be great, but I usually just will do a record swap or that's what it is. You pass it on. You just pass it on. Right. But do you, do you collect any records, Steve? Not, I mean, not vinyl. Um, uh, It's, it's, you know, it's the kind of thing that I think about and would love to do. And if I had a more settled kind of lifestyle um, that I, you know, that I'd love to do that. Um, but, um, uh, but I'm moving around from place to place and, you know, I'm on this, you know, kind of crazy mission. So, you know, my, I, I, I listen to, you know, pretty off the shelf technology is I listen to Sonos and, and digital music right now, but I know the difference and I can appreciate the difference. Um, and I'm glad to see that the, that the vinyl thing is going on. Um, you know, it's, uh, the pace of change of technological change is so rapid. Um, uh, it, it's, it's like, it's almost, you know, once we, almost as soon as we get beyond the, to get to the new tech, we need to start looking at the old tech and what we lo- left behind there. It's a very interesting phenomenon. Um, yeah. And I think the amount of effort, you know, like even just in producing, um, you know, cannabis or, you know, creating a, you know, Harborside, the dispensary, that first model, like everything takes uh, the right due diligence and the effort. And that's what I appreciate about some albums. Like when I look at like some Pink Floyd albums versus, you know, I'm not a, a big Taylor Swift fan, but she's putting out, I guess, monumental albums every eight months, it seems. Right. Right. And we're, we're recording old ones. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think that it's, it's interesting, like the, the part that's cool, not so much cool, but it's interesting is, is the price I think of, of records. Cause it, it hasn't necessarily shifted in the best way. It's still um, hard to produce. Um, uh, still hard to source, um, still expensive, still a few weeks turnaround. Um, but I do think it, it still plays a, a major part in the, the effort of creating a product, if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. I think most artists now that are putting stuff out, they want to have, have it on vinyl at some point now. Like, yeah. it's like, they probably have it on vinyl before. Well, I don't know if you saw point. this, but Houseplant, Seth Rogen's company just did a, a record player and now they're doing a record with every new strain that they put out. So they'll have like cannabis grooves. Um, so I think I think a lot of other companies are starting to find some innovative ways to, to infuse kind of cannabis and maybe some of the artists. Um, so I'll, I'll be interested to see that. 
I, I was thinking about ordering a record from them. Um, I haven't gotten one yet. I haven't ordered any of their product yet, actually. So, well, of course, the records themselves should be made out of cannabis. Well, yeah, ideally, but we, we're we're not that we're not we're not there yet because they're not that's not the advertising. Okay, that's a, that's a challenge. <laughs> right? All right, Seth. Uh, all of you young people that love cannabis and music. And Seth, um, again, please yeah, it, write to the company. <laughs> it should be possible. Um, yeah. Anything right now, um, uh, I believe that records are made out of petroleum. <clears throat> yeah. And anything that you make out of petroleum, you can make out of hemp. We just yeah. have to figure out how to do it. And so I think, you know, that, that, that's a, I like that vision of, uh, of, of hemp, hemp vinyl. Yeah. Well, I, th it's interesting you yeah. say that now because that, that's a good, it's, it's something that is, a thousand percent possible but they were talking about how sleek the and aer aer aerodynamic the uh covering was which is just like a plastic covering that goes over the record player um and it's entry level it's not you know anything crazy it's probably three or four hundred dollars you know decent decent right. price right mm -hmm. um but i was interested about like the artists how many songs would be on it and there's about uh, 15 songs so it was, it was it was a decent i think it was about forty dollars and it and if you bought like a, an ounce it came with the record and then you had he does like one every every month I think it was but you're right it it'd be great if it was made out of um, hemp and to go back to price it is extremely still very expensive to produce records so why not look at that option and, yeah. and be a more conscious consumer and pr producer as well I wonder if it, it would would, it would decrease the cost perhaps overall if it was made out of yeah, well, of I mean, even yeah. Out of initially it would be more expensive and then it would drop, right? So, right. you know, basically when we think about costs in the economic system that we live in, many of the costs are not properly allocated. So you think about petroleum, right? Just the, the gas that you put in your car. Right. Um, nobody's calculating the cost of, 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 of heating up the earth and, and causing all the cancer, right? All that stuff happens. Those are externalities that you typically aren't looked at. So certainly, you know, we know that anything that you make out of petroleum, if you make it out of hemp, if you do it at scale, it's going to be less expensive eventually. Right. And, you know, the, the thing also about purchasing power is that, you know, a lot of people, um, like, even if you just look at, you know, St. John, New Brunswick, when a, a local person tours here and they spend the money to make records, it's pretty much all of their capital, if not dipping into any line of credit they have, because they know people will buy the vinyl versus a CD or a tape or a hoodie. Right. But what I find interesting is, um, you know, the amount of effort that sometimes goes into records, um, the price, like we used to be able to buy a classic rock record, let's say five, 10 years ago for $4.99. Now uh, a Van Halen record is fourteen ninety nine used, maybe if you yeah. can find it, and it's fifty sixty dollars brand new. Um, this is just a, a random like, but the, these they they were making these like splatter records, you know, a long time ago. But you could do this with hemp, and I mean, this was seventy five dollars. Right. These are new records are you know like new hip hop records are a hundred dollars. And people pay for them. So, I mean, if they were made out of hemp, I would definitely, I would actually pay more, even if it was a lower production. So, so what's the main technical problem from your point of view with the records you're using now? I don't know about a technical. Yeah, I don't know if there's like a technical. I think, you know, you don't want to be... Um, contributing, you know, to any issues, you know, that are environmentally impacting. So I, I don't think that you should have crates and crates and crates of records. So I think you should be a conscious consumer unless there's a, a better way to, to make them. Um, no, I don't know about technical. Hmm. Okay. All right. Well, um, I think, I, I think it's possible. I, my, the reason I'm asking is I think probably it's possible to make records out of hemp that are better than the records that are being made out of petroleum. Just need to figure out what a better record means. Like, does it warp less easily? Does it last longer? Yeah. You know, those are the kind of technical questions, like how many plays do you get out of petroleum or what right. temperature does it warp at? You know, something like that. But um, yeah. I, I'm sure, I'm sure that this could be done. Um, uh, and it's, it's, it just seems like such a fitting idea, right?
Well, we'll get our people in touch with everybody's people. And we'll, just, we'll just be making <laughs> yeah. records. Buy hemp records. No, Put I it out there. No, I love that. Well, while we're on the topic of records, yeah. Steve, um, I'm going to uh, ask you a question that I ask every single Strange Grooves guest. So, you're on a desert island, and you can only bring three records with you. What will those records be, and why? Um. One, uh, well, one record would definitely be the Grateful Dead. It would probably be my playlist of 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 uh, of, of 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 favorites. Um, if I had to choose an existing one, it would probably be American Beauty. Um, uh, <clears throat> uh, Louis Armstrong would would be on that list. Um, um, uh, Louis Armstrong doing his blues classic. So it'd be uh, Louis Armstrong's Hot Five and Hot Seven. Um, they did a couple of records. I forget the names of them. Um, and then <clears throat> the last one would um, would probably be more in a in a in a in a meditative kind of mode um all right let me give you rock let me give you rock right this is a really hard question and she <laughs> I, that's why she asked it that's I a know. really hard question okay so um uh i would say definitely the grateful dead um uh um Leonard Cohen would need to be on there as well. The Leonard Cohen um, yeah, it would have to be whichever Leonard Cohen album has um, uh, Tower of Song. Okay. Um, uh, see, cause I don't even remember the albums now uh uh okay and, we know that album <laughs> <laughs> one with that song <laughs> and um uh and then um still staying in that rock and roll groove i would probably need to have the rolling stones in there uh with start me up awesome Huge fan. She loves yeah. the stones. I approve. I like all these. Yeah. <laughs> huge, huge fans over here. Yeah. 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 Sharice is also a huge Bob Dylan fan. That's her. Yes. That's her. her yeah. Dylan, fan. I wouldn't. I Dylan, I think of more as a poet than a rock and roll person. Um, but um, yeah, D Dylan would definitely is, you know, someone who you can listen to over and over again. And he keeps on keeps on giving with 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 new layers. Agreed. Um, God, that would be a horrible situation to find oneself in, though. Huh? Yes, it would, yeah. yeah. But she always asks it. I always am like, oh, don't ask it. Well, but I, as I always say, it brings up some interesting like discussions, and you learn, you know, learn yeah. more about people through it. It's not like a, you know, as I always say, like we always bring it up. Like ours changes like yeah. every episode. Like it's an evolving question. But yeah. yeah, yeah, because like there's some. I mean, there's some songs and musicians that I listen to that are really, really important to me. Leonard Cohen is, you know, if I was going to think of, you know, like musicians that really speak to my soul that I feel like he's saying stuff that I would say almost, Leonard would be there, but I can only get so close to that flame so frequently, right? Because it's hard, right? It's very, very, he's, he's such a demanding artist and he just, he can make me feel something so profoundly that I might not be able to go on with the rest of my day if I listen to it at the wrong time, right? Yeah. So super, super important. But yeah. like if I was on the desert island, would I want to be able to listen to that every once in a while? Or do I want to put on start me up or 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 maybe even safety dance every morning to get that myself dance. going, right? Dance, guys. That's important. Man without, so. man without hats record. Right. <laughs> <Great sense>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Funny, I, I have that record. Oh great. Yeah. Kate will send it to you via yeah. I don't know, bird carrier pigeon. <laughs> yeah. I think it's probably right here now. I just have to look at a curiosity. Right. It should be. Right. 
Make it yellow. All right. Well, um, uh, uh, good good timing on looking for music. I think I think as I mentioned earlier that my voice is going to give out before our time does, and it's it's feeling like it's on the verge of doing that. Do you have a, a, a couple last questions? No, thank you so much for joining us. Just really appreciate you joining it us. It was so much fun, like finally getting to to virtually meet you. I hope one day we get to meet in person. And but thank you so much for being so generous with your time. It was a wonderful conversation. My yeah. my pleasure, and great to see you, Kate. I mean, yeah, great we'll to meet play. you, Cherise. I'll definitely be bringing her out next time I come. Come on out. Yeah, in room in California. <laughs> She'll stuff yeah. me in her suitcase. Oh, we'll yeah. get there one way or another. Yeah, we'll be coming out. All right. All right. Steve, have a good night. Have Say a good hi evening. to Yoli and the doggos for me. Be well. See you.